I'm Simon Williams and um, I'm currently a senior sergeant with the Western Australia Police. Um, prior to that I was a uh, police officer uh, with Westminster Police for uh, nearly 16 years. I first heard about evidence-based policing um, when um, I was running offender management teams um, in Birmingham and we partnered with the University of Cambridge to deliver uh, what was then the, the, the biggest randomised control trial in police anywhere in the world um, called Operation Turning Point. So Operation Turning Point was um, a test of deferred prosecution of low level or first time offenders um, away from the criminal justice system. Um, and that's, that was my introduction into um, this concept, this thing called evidence-based policing. Um, evidence-based policing is um, it's just common sense. It's what works, what doesn't, and what looks promising to keep your communities safer than they were yesterday. So the presentation I've just given was um, about a hotspots policing experiment um, that we conducted in Armadale in Western Australia. Um, it tested uh, the effectiveness of some targeted patrol time um, in micro hotspots uh, where there's chronic or long-term uh, crime problems. Um, they were all public place uh, generated crimes, so nothing that had happened behind closed doors and nothing that had been self-generated by police. So, um, you know, seizure of weapons or drugs, um, these were all public generated um, sort of street level crimes such as burglary, robbery, um, disorders, assaults, public place violence, um, damages, those kind of offences. There's a wealth of evidence um, on the efficacy of or effectiveness of putting a cop in a small micro hotspot, a small place for you know, around about 15 minutes um, to cool those hotspots down, so to prevent crime happening. But most hotspots experiments involve cops having to go back to each of those hotspots day after day after day. What we did in Perth was slightly different. We designed the experiment so we could test not just the um, initial crime prevention um, effects that most hotspot studies will look at, but we were able to measure um, how long do those crime prevention effects last. So there's two things there that I've just described. The first is initial deterrence and then residual deterrence. So how long can we afford not to go back to those places before things start to go really wrong again and crime returns to previous levels. We found that um, certainly in Perth at least, um, police can afford to conduct one 14 minute uh, patrol in a hotspot and they don't have to return for the next four days, but if they leave it more than five days without returning, then crime and the severity of offending as well um, returns to pre-patrol pre levels. When we looked at um, the overall count, so the frequency of crimes, um, there was a 22% reduction when we put one patrol of 14 minutes in to a hotspot per day uh, compared to business as usual policing. Um, that resulted in 224 fewer victims of crime, um, but more significantly, the crime that was left over was far less severe. Um, that severity was measured by a crime harm index, the WA crime harm index, um, that saw um, a 62% reduction. In addition, when we look at um, the breakdown between days where we patrolled compared to periods where the hotspots were left unpatrolled for up to four days and more than five days, the severity of offending significantly increased by a factor of about four if hotspots are left unpatrolled for five or more days. This is a, a really cool finding for anybody else that's looking at these small um, micro locations, uh, concentrations of crime. Uh, or concentrations of severe, severe offending um, where actually we don't have to keep going back every day. Um, we can afford to go and put a, a patrol in place 
and then maybe not revisit for another couple of days or certainly up to four days. Um, and when you think about the uh, current picture, particularly in the UK, but not just the UK, you know, austerity in policing is a, um, an issue for police leaders across the, across the globe. Um, resources are pretty finite um, and, you know, demand on police services um, is pretty high. So we don't have to take up those resources to take up the, that resource time by continually going back every single day. You can actually hit more hotspots, less of the time, and have a greater effect. I would say to, um, to, to any sergeant out there who uh, doesn't think that their team has time, um, this experiment and other experiments um, that have tested how effective patrol, these short doses, these short stays, stints of patrol are, um, have all been delivered as business as usual, with no additional resources, no overtime, um, and they can be done. Um, certainly the experiment that I presented on today in Armadale in Perth was conducted at a time when local policing resources were really under pressure. Um, there was certainly no budget for overtime. Demand was high because of um, the time of year that the um, experiment was conducted in. Um, and we, we did it. We were able to do it as part of business as usual. It's not easy, you have to be resilient, you have to provide a feedback loop to officers, you have to hold people to account, you have to have difficult conversations. Um, but this is about keeping the community safe, this is about cooling down really chronic long-term places that, have, that, are, that, are, that are home to lots of different crimes. And many of those crimes have got real victims, real people, who really suffer as a result. Um, and I always say that this, this should go back to why we're here. We're here to serve the community, not ourselves. And it's really, really important that where you've got evidence that something works and it's really strong evidence, that's something that we should adopt as, uh, into our business as usual or at least test it in our own area. If you haven't got access to any of the clever software that can uh, work out or predict where crimes might happen, um, then you can simply do what many other police forces and jurisdictions have done um, to look at uh, crime in place, and that's simply by putting a grid across your policing area or district or wherever it is you're looking and simply measuring the concentration of crime, so the number of crimes and then the severity of offended in those places compared to all of the other grids in that area. You can definitely do this by yourself. Um, you, I would always say if you've got the opportunity to partner with an academic institution or an academic that's got a skill, particular skill set in this area, then take that opportunity. But if you haven't, most of the evidence um, that's out there is freely available. A lot of it's open access. Um, a lot of it's pretty easy to read these days. Um, and um, it's something that you could quite easily set up and do yourself. I think this is one of, um, one of my biggest bugbears about um, evidence-based policing, is that um, a, a team of people, platoon police officers, academics, will partner with the local policing district um, or area and they will deliver an experiment. They'll track where officers are going, they will track what officers are doing when they're there, um, they might even do community surveys to look at trust and confidence. But the moment that experiment stops and there's enough data gathered, the tracking stops, the feedback stops, and inevitably, and quite sadly, the business as usual prior to the experiment goes back to normal. Now if I was going to go and run Armadale again, I would factor in a two or three month period after we'd hit the point where we got enough data to say right we're going to continue to run this experiment and allow that lag to be able to go and conduct the analysis and then go back to the, the leadership teams there to say here's the effect, here's what we found, now you can either 
continue to do those patrols if we've had a positive effect or if actually they've made no difference then maybe we need to rethink it. Uh, but I think if I was going to, any future experiments I run around this particular space or, or anything else, I think I will be factoring in exactly, exactly that. So we don't, all that hard work and effort that goes into changing what business as usual is, doesn't just get, um, just doesn't just return to, um, you know, pre-experiment conditions. The reason why I've uh, come to present this work at the SEBB conference, um, apart from being invited, um, is um, evidence-based policing uh, talks to three T's traditionally. That's targeting problems, tracking what cops do, so outputs, um, and testing uh, interventions, so different ways of tackling or solving a problem. In West Australia we talk about a fourth T and that's telling. So I think the biggest problem I've seen over time is that um, quite often there'll be some fantastic research uh, that's done in, in, uh, right across policing. Um, but unless we go and tell these stories, unless we take the time to actually speak to colleagues face to face and make that or, or make those findings jump off a page, who's got time to read a 6,000 word journal article? Which police leaders do you know that sit and read criminology, or the Journal of Experimental Criminology, or even the Society of Evidence-Based Policing um, Journal, Police Science? It's time consuming and we're all busy. So I think one of the most important things that anyone that's involved in evidence-based policing, evidence-based practice can do is factor in time to go and talk about what you did, what you found, and how it happened. And that's true when you have a fantastic finding like Armadale hotspots in Perth, but equally true if you do something and it doesn't go well, or you have a backfiring effect, or no effect at all. Because actually, there's probably more learning when we don't get it get it right and I think that's um, there's some cultural barriers in policing around that uh, where generally previously we've been any police uh, operation or strategy that's been put together has been doomed to succeed um, that's not what and that's the, the other thing that evidence-based policing gives you it gives us the ability to actually uh, to keep ourselves honest in policing um, and really understand cause and effect relationships I think that, um, in general, the relationship and the um, communication between academics and policing um, has always been seen as quite poor, but I, I think in my experience, certainly over the last nine or ten years of being involved in this kind of, um, this area of policing, um, it's got significantly better. Um, and there's now a wealth of interest, um, and I think there's... I think it's down to trust, to be honest with you. I think that over time and you know, gradually by police opening the doors and actually sharing data and academics being able to come and take that data away and add value and answer questions that police leaders want answering, I think that that's, there's now real value seen um, in partnering with academic institutions and really understanding um, in some depth um, what our data means. I think the key messages from our experience in Armadale are if, you, if you're going to, if you're planning to test a strategy that involves directed patrol or targeted patrol, partner with an academic, um, involve your um, local community um, and be really clear on the expectations to the officers that are going to deliver and manage the delivery uh, of this patrol. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this content useful. You can get access to each episode's transcript with key learning points, timestamps and references if you get yourself onto my mailing list. 
just go to the main website on policesciencedoctor.com and on the bottom of each page you will find a sign-up form for notifications of new content. Just enter your first name, your preferred email address and the type of organization you work for. You will not get any spam, this is just for me to let you know about new content and for you to get access to all the transcripts. Thank you.